Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself Jonathan MS Pierce. This is a Ukraine war news update extra video giving you extra tidbits and nuggets to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine. Where should we go to first? Well I'm going to talk about something that I think is a little bit worrying. This has been announced by Telegram channel uh, Fighter Bomber. I think he is a, a Russian uh, fighter pilot. This is concerning and not reported by them here though. This is concerning the guided bombs that the Russians have been using. They've been using the FAB 500s and 250s, which are, uh, you know, 250 kilogram munitions or 500 kilogram munitions. These are substantial pieces of explosive ordnance. Uh, it, it appears that the Russians have gone back to the drawing board to create a 1,500 kilogram version. They had to start again with that because... Uh, they were unable to use the tech on the other bombs to to apply that to a, a 1,500 kilogram one. Well, this thread says, yes, the accuracy characteristics are certainly overestimated, uh, and we'll come to that, uh, but the bomb is very serious. The Russian Su-34 has used the FAB-1500, the FAB-1500 UMPK bomb, for the first time during an air defense mission. On the previous day, the media reported that it was a dagger, so a Kinjal missile. So this, the claim here is that Ukrainians reported that a Kinjal had hit because it was, that, I, I presume, that sizable and whatnot. But it wasn't a Kinjal hypersonic missile. Uh, according to our information, it was a FAB 1500 or 1500. Its launch was deemed successful and the aircraft crew was prevent, presented with an award. The information is confirmed by the military pilot fighter bomber. Uh, he writes that the bomb actually had to be assembled from scratch because a unified set of planning and correction modules, the UMPK, which turns free fall projectiles into guided ones, could not simply be removed from the 250 or the 500 kilogram calibers and attached to the 1500. As a result, everything is new, the drop range has increased, and the area of impact ex exceeds two square kilometers with an impact accuracy, so a circle error probable of five meters. The also fighter bomber reports that already now the new FAB 1500 are used on the Sushka, not only new, but also the first series. I don't know what that means. I don't even know what the Sushka means because I've not seen that anywhere else. It might refer to one of the Sioux uh, fighter bombers. Um, and with future improvements, one aircraft will probably be able to carry up to three such projectiles. This is, I think, a real worry here. Uh, another source saying the FAB 1500 has a high drag and a low drag variant. This is the same as with the FAB 500. Russia converted the more aerodynamic FAB 500 M62 uh, into, a, into glide bombs and not the high drag versions. The same has just happened with the FAB 1500. So here are the, uh, the bombs, uh, I presume, before turned into... Uh, the guide bombs so uh, uh, this is the important part uh, the new bomb has a range of 65 kilometers this can be increased to 70 kilometers if dropped from a higher altitude obviously the higher the altitude that the plane has to go to drop the bombs the the greater the chance of being caught by air defense so that's a trade-off you have but this i think is a real worry uh, there's absolutely no doubt about the fact that this is a worry. I mean, these are huge bombs. I mean, look at the size of that. That is one big bomb. I mean, there's there's a human. You know, a human for size. There you go. It's it's pretty um, sizable. So I think there, uh, if the Russians can make these and use these um, in scalable quantities, then the Ukrainians are going to be maybe in a little bit of trouble. Um, so this goes back to needing those airframes to be able to push back the Russian airframes. Uh, they need air defense systems that have decent ranges on them and can be safely placed behind enemy lines and, and, and re remain safe. And they need their own versions of these as well. So that's, yeah, a worrying development. Uh, Chris O'Wicky, giving a long thread here, says, Wounded Wagner fighters have reportedly been thrown out of hospitals with their treatments unfinished. Their payments for medical care have been terminated and payments and benefits to their families have also been stopped. Quote, a total scam, says one outraged Wagnerite. You could see this coming, really, couldn't you? 
So the, the Russian government is short on money. Wagner have promised X, Y, and Z through the Russian government, right? Um, but now that Prigozhin and Wagner are kind of no more, and in, interestingly today, the British government says, we have made Wagner a terrorist organization. We prescribed them. It's official. It's like, a bit late, mate. I mean, Prigozhin's dead and they're kind of no more. Um, nonetheless, you, well, you could well have predicted that this would happen, which is the, the, Russian, the Kremlin, the Russian government saying, yeah, okay, all that stuff that was promised to you by v Wagner, if that includes you, you know, money, well, Wagner are no more financially. Uh, they're not going to pay you and we're not going to pay you. So, if you, you, you know, on your way, mate. Uh, we Can Explain, which is uh, an organization, reports that Russian government appears to have abandoned its previous commitments to Wagner members following Yevgeny Prigozhin's death. Putin's spokesperson, Dmitry Peskov, said two days after Prigozhin died that Wagner now had no state funding. Earlier during Prigozhin's mutiny, Putin had said publicly that the Russian state had paid over a billion dollars to Wagner. It appears that this flow of money has abruptly been cut off likely with dire consequences for thousands of Wagner fighters and their families, which I, I guess you... Yes, you might say that this is pretty, uh, I'd say pretty mercenary, but it's almost the opposite. Uh, this is pretty harsh of the Russian government and maybe a good decision financially for them, you know, you could argue. But I think from a PR point of view, there's going to be a lot of Wagner fighters and families that are now going to be very angry with the Russian government. So, uh, that may have consequences of its own. Um, okay, MO reports that the hospitals which are treating Wagner fighters have all ceased doing so. Wagner's head of medical services has claimed that the last wounded patient was transferred for treatment and all insurance payments, compensation salaries and bonuses were paid. However, Wagner members and their families say in chat rooms that in reality many have been left without medical care and documentation. The Wagner call centre seems to have shut down abruptly following Prigozhin's death and is no longer taking inquiries. MO interviewed the friend of a Wagner fighter who suffered shrapnel wounds and was treated in a hospital in Anapa in the Krasnodar region. Many wounded Wagner members have been treated there. The hospital was visited by Prigozhin in January 20. 23, as you can see there. The Wagnerites was due to have surgery, but it was cancelled after being postponed for a long time. His friend says, in, quote, in July, they were all told that Wagner medical bills had been paid until the end of July, and all the wounded must leave the hospital immediately. Wherever he wants to be treated, let him be treated there, uh, and they did not give any money for treatment. End quote. Wives now find themselves facing the need to care at home without any assistance or medical expertise for wounded men who need hospital treatment. Quote, there are no certificates of medical resources. We are waiting at home and I have no idea how to treat him, says one. Another complains, quote, we can only treat them ourselves. The company does not help in any way with rehabilitation or treatment. Not surprisingly, online Wagner chat rooms have been flooded with outraged commentary on the situation from fighters and their relatives. MO has compiled some of the responses and that's kind of what i was talking about like that's not gonna that's not gonna be a good look for the russian government uh, just a bit of a pr own goal here's a quote from a few of them half of my insides are gone a leg was broken by a shell i received only combat pay and a bonus and silence on the wound another we got sick pay for june not yet for july and we don't know when or if it will come another one it took three hours to call uh, you get through five or ten times, but as soon as you get to the queue, the line goes dead. Another, a total scam. Another, we have never seen any money from the company. We've been in hospital since May, amputation. Uh, now we have been discharged. We are recovering on our own. And yet another, we have never received any money for the injury. Bravo. And the final one, I also didn't receive anything for the wound. My contract ended on the 3rd of May. Hopefully things will stabilise and no fighter will be forgotten. I mean, goodness. Uh, I think they will. Um, the optimism seems to be misplaced, uh, continues Chris O'Wiggy. However, considering what's happening with Wagner pay and benefits... Uh, sorry, the optimism seems to be misplaced, however, considering what's happening with uh, Wagner pay and benefits. According to Tochka, Wagnerites who participated in the war are being denied the status of combat veterans documentation that would allow them to access state benefits and are not being issued awards 
or the promised pardons in the case of mobilized convicts. Uh, the denial is in violation of existing laws. All Russian participants in the war are granted the status of, quote, combat veterans under a law passed in April 2023. And in August, the government decreed that all volunteers, including Wagner members, would receive a certificate. Such certificates guarantee a range of benefits. Veterans and family members of the deceased are entitled to monthly payments, free travel and medicines, housing and utilities and property tax benefits. The Speaker of the State Duma, uh, Volodin, stated earlier this year that, quote, everyone who today risks their lives defending our country should have an equal status, regardless of whether the soldier is an officer, a volunteer, everyone who participates. Perhaps inevitably, this commitment seems to have been abandoned since Prigozhin's death. Veteran certificates and awards to Wagner members recognising them as veterans are not being issued due to unfulfilled bureaucratic procedures at the Russian MOD. Wagner's personnel managers have announced that they are in a situation of force majeure. They have suspended the, insurance, the issuance sorry, of certificates of participation in the war, citing, quote, more important and prioritised tasks of the employees. This has had a major impact on the families as it prevents them from assessing social support measures including discounts on kindergarten fees, meals at educational institutions and legal privileges. Relatives of deceased ex-convicts are also complaining that the documents of pardon are not being issued. This prevents their children being enrolled in universities to study law as the children of convicts are barred from enrolling and working in that field. It's probable that the Russian government is trying to get rid of the heavy financial burdens of supporting the Wagner rights. Yeah, damn right there. But in so doing, it risks creating a large group of military experienced men who are embittered against it. Whilst treating Wagner's fighters like Trump University students might help the Russian government to save money in the short term, it may create further trouble for the regime in the future. Uh, yeah, I, I can't agree with that analysis more. I think this is yeah a short term financial decision with long term um, popularity ramifications for the Kremlin. Right, uh, thanks, Chris O'Wiki. And moving on to the next topic, uh, we come to a bit of Challenger love here. So the Challenger first Challenger two, two tank was taken out yesterday. Here we've got a Ukrainian Challenger crew member extolling the virtues of the tank. So I'm just going to read so, you, yeah. you know, the first... read you his. Uh, what he says the subtitles because i know many of you listen so he's he's by a challenger that you see in the background and challenger firing and doing stuff and he says but i'll tell you that this tank is like a sniper rifle it undoubtedly set a world record when it hit a t-55 from a distance of more than five kilometers so that was true in in the in the last gulf war i believe a challenger got the record for that uh when you're driving in a t-80 he continues uh, and you're not sure if you'll make even one shot because the loading mechanism might malfunction or some sensor won't work. I mean, you're just basically scaring the Russians with the sound of the engine. Uh, its advantage is that it has a long range. So he's now talking about the uh, Challenger. Its advantage is that it has a long range. Uh, it's a machine designed to operate at a long distance and target only machinery. Here, there is no such thing as in our tanks, which are meant for infantry with fragmentation explosive shells causing the infantry to panic. No, these tanks, so the Challenger tanks, were made to counter the Soviets and simply to destroy machinery. For manpower, there are manpower and artillery, uh, he says. So in other words, you know, if you want to take out manpower, you can use other things to do that. But this is a, this is a tank to take out machinery and you know, buildings and whatnot. Uh, because the tank is a tremendous force. Uh, especially a tank like this. If you take just one tank, it has a lot to offer, especially in our conditions when infantry sees you coming in a tank. Uh, even if there are no more rounds, they happily come out of their trenches and go behind you to finish him off with their feet, he says. With these tanks, anyone who sees them is like, wow, what is this? I've been on a T-64, a T-72 and a T-80. I fought on a T-80. Until you get hit, if you are, you are, you don't stand much of a chance. The ammunition immediately detonates and you're sent flying somewhere in the fields. On this tank, so to say, so on the Challenger 2, the ammunition is placed in such a way that it can withstand several hits. 
even if it penetrates, it's unlikely to hit the ammunition and cause it to detonate. Everything here is designed for the people. If you want to do something in our tanks, it would take you half a day to reach a bolt, to cut up a wrench, weld it and readjust it to get, the, to get there. There's no other way. This thing is made for people. A few more companies for our country, it would be quite good. <laughs> you said a bit of an understatement there. Uh, I think their tanks would be afraid to come out. They would work only from closed positions at a distance of seven to eight kilometers off axis and not always. To have very good reconnaissance and take down a lot of enemy tanks. So he's really t talking about a challenger having very good reconnaissance to, to be able to take out a lot of enemy tanks. When everything is clear, I mean, where the mines are, the enemy tank comes out, bang, bang. Oh, obviously trying to work out, you know, the translation here. Um, making sure that it kind of makes sense. I mean, with this tank, you can really work like that. Like a wandering tank, so to speak. And it will do just fine. Well, of course... Well, one, of course, no, because one is not enough. You should have two in a pair working. If used correctly, it will be just... I don't know. Death and horror for them. That's all. So there you go, just a bit, a bit of love being shown for the Challenger there, calling it the sniper of the the tank, of, of the range of tanks they have. This is the sniper rifle. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, however, gets hit by a mine and or rolls over a mine and then gets hit by a lancet and it unfortunately is no more. So I don't know, someone was talking about how some of the Challenger 2s have a mine detection uh, component at the front but the ones that have been sent out to Ukraine don't have those yeah, typically okay Constantine who you might hear a lot from on Andrew Perpetua's live streams he can be quite uh, quite a realist when it comes to the challenges that Ukraine are, um, are facing uh, he has fought before, I think, if, if I get this correct. I, I don't think he's in Ukraine anymore. He's got a job in Europe somewhere. But he has fought previously in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, possibly before this iteration of the conflict. So this is his tuppence about uh, training. Um, my thoughts regarding the issues reported in the Kiev Independent article about the evaluation of NATO training in the 32nd Mechanized Brigade. Please consider this text as a supplementary piece interjected with my opinions, my own and those I spoke to in the field. I got in touch with not only the 32nd but the 92nd Mechanized Brigade. The 92nd fought alongside the 32nd and can provide unique insight as they are experienced and saw firsthand the schism between theory and practice. Our new infantry brigade did a heroic job in the given circumstances, limited time, resources and ammunition. My conversations with everyone outside of the 32nd were marked with gratitude as nobody appreciates people willing to do the job of infantry more than infantry. Don't doom over this text. My effort is to give another small input into making Western training more effective. Let me also point out that when dealing with losses, emotions run high and there is an opening for toxicity to seep in. The disconnect between the expectations set by the training and the reality of the Ukrainian battlefield can be explained better with the lack of communication at the higher level than with Western arrogance. It can still get you angry, but you would be a fool to escape into a simple narrative uh, that relies on a lack of intelligence or empathy. You can uh, not expect Western militaries to be perfectly in tune with the requirements of the Ukrainian battlefield at the institutional level when our institutions run into similar problems with less distance to the front. If you think Ukrainian training is perfect, I have an illegal bridge to sell you. <laughs> you can watch the videos of Western instructors saying farewell to Ukrainian recruits anytime. Twitter replies made by armchair generals do not represent them. I think they very much care. Okay, the background. The 32nd Mechanized Brigade was formed at the beginning of 2023 and partially equipped with Western equipment with the core of its mechanized infantry utilizing the American M113 armored personnel carrier. Its infantry battalions underwent training in the spring of 2023 in a NATO country. After the return to Ukraine, the brigade received equipment and ammunition and was fully staffed. During the summer, the 32nd Brigade was deployed alongside the 92nd Brigade, which had been fighting for the past nine months in the Svatova axis in the northeast of Ukraine. The deployment quickly became problematic and resulted in heavy casualties eventually forcing the command to reconsider. Now, this was 
If you remember the article in the Kiev Independent I talked you through the other day, well, I didn't go through the whole article, but th this was from this brigade up in Svatova talking about how you know they didn't they didn't have enough you know quality training uh, or, or the right kind of training, and uh, they were just uh, getting outdone by the Russians in certain elements of the battlefield, and that that was having really dire consequences on them. And they're saying, yeah, we're we're holding on, but at kind of at what cost? Um, so anyway, Constantine continues with the training. So he says, I've spoken to one of the sergeants of the brigade with the call sign Nestor about the training they received abroad. Overall, the training included basic infantry reconnaissance and assault tactics. Nestor said that the most interesting and useful part was the reconnaissance training. We learned how to get close to the enemy and build secure observation posts. It was essential. They also learned how to adjust artillery and navigation. Right, navigation was useful, spotting was interesting, but it was not particularly useful on the battlefield so far. Uh, however, his overall verdict of the training was mixed. Quote, it was like the instructors were in a vacuum. We received training in infantry tactics, while this war is a war of artillery and drones. On one occasion, Nestor's commander asked if trainers would at least consider the presence of drones on the battlefield. The answer was a damning no. Uh, you, don't, quote, you don't take your drones with you, and the only drone we have available is DJI Phantom 4, but we can't even use it for bureaucratic reasons, he recalls them saying. So they continue the training as is. Western provided training fell short of considering current realities on the battlefield. The brigade's first deployment in Ukraine was to hold the defence in the Svatova direction. However, Nestor com commented, quote, Our battalion received zero defensive combat training. It was all assault orientated. Oriented. Um, on a positive note, the sergeant says that our infantry learned to move and storm buildings and trenches. But if you consider this basic infantry training, it was good. The infantry companies spend seven days practicing assault combined arms operations, storming different objectives. One day it was a small town, another day it was an enemy trench. Quote, we went through swamps, mud and cold nights. Once our instructor said that living it through it on the battlefield would be easier if we experienced it, these conditions now. He was right. But the companies received too little training on surviving the battlefield. Quote, there was no camouflage training. The infantry didn't learn how to conceal positions, build bunkers and no defensive combat training. In the end, Nestor adds that one of the things they needed was EOD awareness training. Quote, you must understand the battlefield is littered with booby traps, mines, and explosive ordnance. Uh, we, uh, I presume that's explosive ordnance detection. We knew it before the deployment. Everyone in Ukraine knows it. We asked trainers if we could get any training on the topic, but for some reason, the trainers refused to even discuss it. It was a taboo. Quote, we regret the lack of EOD training is specifically, it could have saved lives. The deployment. After the training in Germany by a NATO country was complete, uh, so it doesn't mean that it was necessarily trained by Germans, uh, and after a short period in Ukraine, they were sent to reinforce the Svatova di direction. Problems appeared immediately. Nestor's battalion was deployed shoulder to shoulder with one of the battalions of the 92nd Brigade. The 92nd Brigade soldier with a call sign zero explains, quote, it appears that they were trained on another planet. What was obvious to us was a, a terra incognito for them. He continues with the story of one of their first encounters with the 32nd Infantry. We were driving 15 kilometers from the front line and I noticed a military Ural truck with a full platoon clustered around near one of the small local grocery stores. They acted like they didn't know it was a war zone. We had to stop and tell them that Zala Russian drones were reported around. The platoon commander did not know the enemy had such capabilities. A grave mistake. So the, the idea is like, you got to... <laughs> Don't hang around in a massive group of people around a truck, right? Because they're going to be they're going to see the truck and try and blow the truck up, which means you're going to blow up all those people, right? If you're going to go and hang around, hang around a little bit further away from the truck, and maybe not all in one place. A grave mistake in NATO training was that a company commander stayed in the trenches with the company. While it sounds heroic and may work when facing a poorly equipped enemy, Russia is well equipped and has hundreds of drones. The costly mistake was corrected after they lost a couple of positions. Quote, the company commander has to have the eyes in the sky. He has to have his own drone stream and communicate with platoon or group commanders. It was a costly lesson for Nazar's unit. It cost us lives. I asked why a company commander couldn't stay in the trench. My friend from the 92nd Brigade explained that when the company commander is in the trench, he becomes another link in the chain of command. Quote, please understand controlling 100 soldiers in, a com in combat is a hard task. The high-level commander watches 
a drone stream and makes decisions. He gives an order to the company commander over the radio. The company commander has to understand exactly what is going on to make decisions and pass orders to the platoons. For that, you need to observe the battlefield from the top. Try sitting under tank shelling and yelling over the radio while being yelled over the radio yourself. It is much more efficient when the company commander has his own command and control room with drone streams coming in. He can make calm and weighed decisions looking at the battlefield instead of listening to what is happening, and it is no longer a game of telephone. In the current battlefield, even the group or platoon commander has to have a tablet without special map application to be effective, and you cannot rely on a stupid enemy anymore. They evolved, summarizes Nestor. We, n we knew none of that, and no one could share the experience and acknowledge with us. But now we are smarter, but the price was terrible. End quote. Another capability that was under-trained might surprise, driving. It might sound absurd to some, but those familiar with the battlefield know how hazardous and costly even a simple drive toward or away from the front can be. Our drivers must be more experienced in driving at night. Driving during the day is too dangerous. Training for night driving operations is critical to avoid casualties and the loss of valuable equipment. It's also emblematic. It may not seem a top priority for NATO training personnel with a shortened schedule. However, its importance must be communicated just like any other discrepancy here and elsewhere. They were talking about this on uh, Andrew Perpetua's live stream last night. And that was the idea that they, they basically have to drive at night as otherwise it's too dangerous and they don't have enough night vision goggles. And so therefore, and they're desperate for night vision goggles. Uh, but um, yeah, they talk about how, you know, it's, it's a skill driving at night and, and you just need some training. You, they, it's one of those things that you need it. And, and when you don't have it, unfortunately, literally people die, like trucks roll over. Uh, and that's what happens. You know, sometimes you see you know, things dr having driven off bridges or tanks, you know, in, in weird places. And you think, how the hell did that happen? When you understand that actually there's a lot of, a lot of driving takes place at night uh, and they don't have night vision goggles, then you can understand how some of those errors are made. So conclusion, the disconnect of the NATO training leads to a brigade being unprepared on the battlefield. Specifically, the lack of drones, defensive, mine awareness and EOD training has led to unnecessary casualties on the battlefield. To avoid a similar situation in the future, no, Na Ukraine needs to treat NATO training as basic infantry training instead of a complete cycle of brigade battalion level preparation. We need to perform post-training exercises and adapt the units to the newest technologies and tactics on the battlefield. Ultimately, the brigade has trained enough experience, gained enough experience to be effective, but the cost could have been much smaller. This is something that's been said an awful lot, which is, you know, the basic training is good. Like the, what NATO do is good. It's, it's, not, it's not that it's not good, but it's not ideal for a cross section of Ukrainian troops being trained. Now, you could say that's, that's a problem with Ukraine selecting who gets the training. But, and be that as it may, it would be advantageous for there to be, you know, a range of different training schedules created um and that takes effort but it but it's it's needed and there needs to be the uh, a culture of listening to feedback of what the ukrainians are saying about the training and adapting and really adapting to the needs of those ukrainian soldiers is is paramount um anyway i thought that might be of interest to you uh, let me know what you think right and move on to a, a comment here and this comment made me go yeah uh, but it made me think sort of a little bit wider than that. So uh, I love this. So Martin, uh, Martin Baldwin says, the French go on strike because they slightly increase the retirement age. So this is to do with you know, strikes and, and riots and stuff recently. A lot of it connected to M M Emmanuel Macron's desire to raise the pension age or retirement age. Uh, and I agree with this personally, but I know some French people might not, but their retirement age is 62. So you can draw a pension at the age of 62. And the problem is where the demographic pyramid used to go like that, it's now starting to look like that. And this is going to be a really big problem for everyone in the, in the world. Actually, China is suffering a real big demographic shift. Um, but it is going to be a massive challenge. Uh, and you add to that things like... Uh, the automation of jobs and all sorts of stuff. Uh, not enough people working down here to give the taxes for, for a burgeoning older generation who then aren't working. And if you're French and you're not working from 62, then that's, um, and then the average 
you know, life expectancy is going up, although actually necessarily the case, but there are more people who are of retirement age, uh, then you know, who's paying for that? Where's the money coming from? So the French are like, right, we need to increase the, or Macron is, we need to increase the retirement age. And the French are like, no, we're going on strike. Uh, I don't really want to talk about that. In particular. I mean, I was, I was teaching when it was the retirement age of 63 in the UK and it got moved up to 67 like that. And we were like, damn, that's annoying. But actually we just took it and it's 67. And there you go. Uh, and that's, that's, maybe that's the British not being enfranchised enough to, or unionized enough or whatever. Or we just saw the reality of like, yeah, we're getting older and we need to work longer. Anyway, that's not really what, what I want to talk to you about. So he says the French go on strike because they slightly increase the retirement age. Russians get called up, have to pay for their equipment. So this is in, in reaction to one of the Chris O'Wiki threads where they're like, those guys are waiting by the railway station. They've been dumped there. They've had to pay for their own. They've been mobilized. They've had to pay for their own equipment uh, in, in many cases and for their transport to there. And then they're dumped and they don't know what they're supposed to do. So he said, Russians get called up, have to pay for their own equipment, don't get paid, don't get food or drink, have to suffer extreme hardship and are more likely to go to die for a dictator who, who doesn't care less about them. For a war whose soldiers will not personally benefit from. Uh, I'd, be ha I'd be happy when they get Putin and the criminal gang and all those people who committed war crimes in court. Yeah, of course. But, but there's something interesting about this. So, uh, Russia, you think communist, former communist state, uh, you would think it'd be heavily unionized, but I, d I don't know. that. I mean, it's more just like autocratic. No one has rights unless the Kremlin say you've got rights. What this talks to me about is enfranchisement, right? having power and this goes back to democracies and functioning democracies so france which is you know fairly heavily unionized um and you may decry unions and whatever but the point of a union is to give power to the working people so when you're talking about sort of marxist ideals here where it, you know capital when you talk about people being close to the value that they create. So when the when the workers are so far away from like having anything to do with the the value they create, and they're just used as these commodities, and they have no power. So in a purely capitalist state, it's like you 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 use workers and you pay them as little as you can, and that's great because you need to maximize your profits. So everyone is is you know bowing down to the shrine of, of profit maximization. So you have this situation where, you know, people are just treated as uh, a means to profit, right? And then, so, so what you want to do is enfranchise them with the, with the power to, you know, have, have representation and to have rights and so on and so forth. So you get to this point where hopefully there's a happy medium uh, between you know wanting to make profit and and the capitalist ideals but without screwing over the workforce in such a massive way and uh, that um, to have that you need a functioning democracy as well because you need to be able to vote in uh, governments that are going to allow you to have laws that support your the the the, the electorate right the people living there and we need to be where beware ourselves of democratic backsliding like the US, the UK, uh, how, how are we as, as democratically healthy as we should be? No, I'd argue absolutely not. A huge problems with the democratic institutions and mechanisms in both countries and, and other democratic democracies around the world. You know, very few democracies are, are nearing perfection, right? They're, I don't think we have enough representation in this country. I think there's huge problems with first past the post. I think, you know, for example, in the US, I, I think there are lots of issues. I think that you need uh, the Electoral College needs to be reformed. I think you need uh, first past the post being reformed. I think you need lobbying essentially outlawed or hugely regulated. It's quid quo pro uh, quo, quid pro quo. It's basically legalized corruption, uh, so on and so forth. Same in the UK. I don't think MPs should have second jobs. I think they should be paid more. Uh, but the, the, if they take second jobs, it should be very closely regulated because basically they're, they're getting paid as being consultants 
to then make decisions on behalf of who's paying them rather than on behalf of their, the, the electorate. Okay, so on and so forth. There's, there's lots of issues and we don't want to democratically backslide because it's so damn difficult to get that back, right? And we need to hold on to that. Why? Because it's for the benefit of all of us in the countries we live in. Because when you look at someone like Russia that has no enfranchisement, that people are politically disenfranchised, Right? They have. They are just passive. There's nothing they can do about it. They can't vote po Putin out. In fact, there's a, there's a. Go and listen to Ukraine the latest from yesterday. I think it was um, that the podcast from the Daily Telegraph. They talk about this one region of Russia where Kremlin doesn't have has no influence over the mechanisms of voting, and it looks like United Russia are going to lose. The election there and so it looks like the kremlin are going to move in and try and change it so that, that can't happen and and it's absolutely fascinating it's, it's just like uh, it's horrible it's like there you've got one small area where you could possibly get some some semblance of democracy uh you know filter through and it's shut down or, or the kremlin seeks to shut it down it's just you know there there is no power for the people there and and you look to someone like france and you, you may get annoyed at people striking but but it, but it's an annoyance that actually we sh arguably we should we should strive for because god damn it that is power to the people to the workers right now in that case i think actually you know the government's right there uh, uh, but the fact that they 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 are enfranchised to be able to say no we don't agree with this and, and this is how and you know and we're all going to shout about how we don't agree and we we have the power to say something about that is super important as soon as and this is why i have a problem with like the, the mass move to the union the unionization now you free marketeers out there are going to be like oh the unions are terrible blah, blah, blah. it's like yeah do you know what unions fought for do you know in it's so in the uk like maternity rights uh, weekends um you know working we all these kind of things like we wouldn't have without without being fought for by by unions so they get us you know you'd still have the oh you know free marketeers you know pure free marketeers were still the prevailing kind of economic actors then you would still have children working down mines like the factories act and the climbing boys act uh, and the agricultural gangs act back in the victorian period were, were the, the legislation that came about from over overcoming what the free marketeers were demanding, which was um, to be able to have children working down the mines. It's like, no, we don't think we should have seven-year-olds down the mines now, actually. Now, if you're cool with seven-year-olds down the mine, then, you know, fair enough. But I'm not, right? And, you know, out of that came schooling. Out of that came education. And out of that becomes, you know, an enfranchisement of the electorate, of people, because knowledge is power. And so on and so forth. And so, if you want, if you want to be able to use people as as a means to an end, completely, you know, in a purely capitalist way, then I, I'm going to have problems with that. But likewise, in a completely authoritarian way, in like Russia, which I see as basically a weird fascistic iteration of communist Soviet Union, then people are equally as as disenfranchised there, but just in in a completely centralized way. Where the Kremlin is is the new Politburo, uh, you know, United Russia Democratic Party is new Politburo. Then you've got this same these two same places where, like, the working class, where ordinary people are just pawns being uh, manipulated by those who get material gain out of them being manipulated. Whether it's material, political, and economic gain through the oligarchy and kleptocracy. Uh, that that you see in Russia, so all the money is concentrated in in those few to like pure kind of capitalistic way where where that seems to be the case as well because it tends towards a kind of corporatism and and so on and so forth. So I always you know argue for somewhere in the middle being quite nice, you know, a bit moderate me. Uh, so some kind of mixed economy where you had the best of both worlds, where you had the 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 capitalism and and the inspiration and, and so on and so forth but you have some sensible regulations say yeah but if it goes wrong mate we don't want you screwing over the workforce so it's some happy medium which which therefore gives power to and and thus representation for working people and and everyone you know in, in the country and so uh i this to me this comment i know this is a massive like 
ramble. But this comment to me like speaks to the difference between France and, and Russia in, in a really powerful way. Uh, and the people in France and the people in Russia. Like the people in Russia just can't do any of that. And again, it doesn't matter what you think about unions, but they can't do that. They can't do that in Russia. Uh, and instead, they're mobilized, sent to war, having to pay for their own clothes and having to pay for their own travel and sent to a war that they don't, uh, they, they don't get any material benefit out of. And their lives are thrown into the meat grinder of, uh, of pointlessness. Just, yeah. Um, just don't, don't give up. Don't give up your striving for political representation for democratic ideals and for your power as a citizen, whatever country you live in. Don't democratically backslide because you can end up like Russia. So, so important. And that's where I'm going to leave it today because I've, I've banged on for too long. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to have absolutely enraged loads of people by even daring to mention that uh, the UK or the US is not, you know, democratically perfect. Uh, it's a damn sight more perfect than Russia. But hey, I think we've got a long way to go. Uh, and, and for maybe mentioning unions, that might trigger some of you. Uh, but do you know what? I could give you a list of, of some of the things that unions have achieved that you're happily happily taking advantage of. So uh, um, they're not always perfect uh, and they're sometimes bloody annoying. Uh, but I think that's a price worth paying for uh, giving working people um, power. Anyway, uh, take care. Speak soon.